Are we live? I think we're live. Are we live? Okay, I'm smiling. We're live. We're live. Hey, everybody. It's power session time. Excited to dive into today's topic. I've got a little bit of a different camera set up. It's not right on the end of my screen, so my screen's actually down here. My camera's set up on a little tripod back there, just so I'm not quite so in the face, so it gives me a little more room to breathe. Um, you can see my studio going on back here for some of the videos we're creating, some of the courses that we're creating. Got my big green screen set up and some lights to try and make me look pretty. So anyway, got light coming in up here, so if I'm a little blurry, I apologize, but we are live. So uh, super excited to see everybody here. Uh, if this is your first time attending a uh, power session, I am your host. My name is Paul Blanchard. I'm the president of the Habit Finder and the Augmentino Leadership Institute. Uh, super excited to have you here. Everything that we talk about here comes from the way we think, because the way we think is as far upstream as you can get into personal development. My personal mission is to make personal development personal again. Um, somewhere along the way, it became a marketing game. <laughs> It came, became about uh, the currency of attention rather than the currency of transformation. Um, and I, I don't share that, I don't wanna be condescending about that, but we've spent millions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of hours with over 150,000 entrepreneurs and business leaders being able to hone an understanding of how you think. Because that's the challenge, is there's what we're trying to do and what we're trying to shift and what we're trying to create and then there's the way we're thinking. And some of the ways we're thinking is supporting what we wanna create. And that's where it just, it makes sense and we get in that zone or that flow or whatever we wanna call it. But then there's parts of our creation and what we're thinking about wanting to create where our habits of thinking are not supporting us and they're sabotaging us. And those are really frustrating to work with because they're unconscious. We are not conscious of them. You know, for example, I work with uh, clients who are very conscious of how much they care about people, but not as conscious of how much they care about people as long as they're not idiots, <laughs> you know? And, and not understanding why certain people irritate them so much, especially those that they're closest to, where their guard is down and certain things aren't as high a level of consciousness um, and awareness. Um, so just really important to understand that. Also, like I have a lot of clients who understand consciously that perfection is not possible but have unconscious thought processes that don't care whether you believe perfection is possible or not. The only way it can operate is if perfection is the standard. So we create these undercover, these under the hood battles and dichotomies between how we want to be thinking consciously. And that's one of the challenges is consciously we're often focused on how we would like to be thinking and focused on creating things that we'd like to be able to create rather than understanding the deeper battle, and that's really what we're taking on here. So, <laughs> definitely. Um, cool. Oh, good, Shar, you found me. Um, anyway, with that said, uh, we're gonna be diving into commitment today, okay? That is the theme of our conversation today. Let me make sure I've got this in a, in a good spot here without too bad of a glare and where you can still see me. So, everything that I wanted to talk about today came down, down to one word as I was thinking about what could really serve our power session audience today. Um, and then uh, making sure we've got a little bit of time to be able to answer questions and to, uh, to be able to engage a little bit on here, which the last couple of times um, haven't been able to do that as much. So I'm making a conscious effort to do that. So I've had some really fun conversations with clients around commitment um, recently. And I wanna talk a little bit about some challenges that we're seeing universally in the entrepreneurs and business leaders that we work with. And one of the core challenges, and remember we're battling this consciously, where we can be much more rational, we can be much more practical, but then we're battling it unconsciously. And our unconscious mind is driven by things that are far more irrational. In fact, it's just a, a fun little aside to evolutionary psychology. Your unconscious mind is driven primarily by three things, survival, sex, and status and it'll do anything it can to protect or avoid pain in those three areas. And then our conscious mind has just become better at rationalizing that irrational drive. So we've got these two dynamics, okay? Got that? Really difficult to really understand these two dynamics. It's kind of like uh, um, those driver's ed cars that have steering wheels on both sides, except you've got a steering wheel for your conscious mind and then your unconscious mind has got a steering wheel as, as well. 
Now, ultimately, you get to make the final call as to whether you turn left or turn right in your life. But if you're getting tired, you're stressed, you're overwhelmed, and a number of other t t variables and tangibles in your life, um, you might loosen your grip a little bit on your own steering wheel, which gives your unconscious mind an opportunity to take the wheel. Um, and then we don't become conscious of it again until we're beating the crap out of ourselves for making those choices again or procrastinating again or not being able to create what we saw so clearly in our minds, okay? All right, so when it comes to commitment, first, foundational principle. Most people are driven by this. Most of us are driven by how we feel. And what is how we feel? How we feel as a result of, of the, the storm in our mind, the noise in our mind, the emotions we have, our personality tendencies, all these different things. How we feel is a downstream symptom to how we're thinking. And so many of us are allowing this to be the driver in our lives. Now remember what I talked about, you've got the conscious mind, okay? For this example, we'll just call it the upper mind, okay? The upper mind that is driven by rationality, okay? We want to be able to explain and justify. But then we've got our lower mind, okay? And our lower mind is irrationally driven. The lower mind's number one weapon for being able to push its irrational agenda is how you feel. Now, one of the challenges, many of us have not been acknowledging how we actually feel or how we're actually thinking in the moment, but what we all we've done is just gotten better at rationalizing the feeling rather than be able to discover, okay, we just come up with reasons. Rather than be able to evolve, we just come up with justification. So it's interesting, we know this dynamic. We know that the lower mind drives us with feelings. So what does the upper mind drive us with? Well, it could drive us with practical judgment, could drive us with uh, common sense, with curiosity, which is my favorite personal development phrase in terms of actually executing self-awareness, curiosity. It's beautiful because it can, it can explore both what people would perceive as negative and positive with the same productive energy, okay? So our upper mind could do these things to put us in the driver's seat on these, on our feelings. But for most of us, they don't. For most of us, we don't allow this stuff to put us in the driver's seat on our feelings. We just allow it to rationalize them. Talked a little bit about this last week when I talked about preferences versus principles. That if your personal development is driven with an underlying agenda of your preferences, well, that's just not who I am, and that's just how I am. And all these limitations that we put on ourselves because of preferences over time, then more than likely we are using our upper mind to rationalize the feelings, meaning we're not looking to change them. We're actually looking to appease them, to be congruent with them. But there are inherent challenges to try and, being, to try and be con congruent with a symptom. Wouldn't we rather just change the cause, change what's driving us, change what's creating all this frustration? Okay? So we want to understand the dynamic, okay? And I have no doubt I'm probably already losing people. So I want, I want to make sure, let me break down this really simple, okay? In fact, let's clear the board, okay? Just important things to remember, most people are driving their lives by feeling, okay? And rather than using their upper mind to create practical judgment, common sense, and curiosity to be able to shift and act regardless of the feeling, they're using it to rationalize, okay? And to limit themselves based on preferences. So let me take you through the typical commitment process, and then we'll talk about a couple major commitments in life that we really aren't doing the right way, okay? In terms of this dynamic between the two. Most people feel something, then act on it,
and then make a decision as to whether to commit to it or not, okay? So I feel like going to a theme park. So I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna ride a couple rides and then I'll decide whether I liked it or not, whether I should stay, whether I should keep going, whether I should keep riding. Innocent example, we're talking about theme parks. But then when we teach ourselves this over and over again with innocent things that don't have as big of an impact on the larger picture of our lives, then we run into problems like, I don't feel like, or I feel like building a business, okay? So we feel like building a business. So I'm gonna make a few phone calls, because that seems to be a common thread for a lot of people's businesses, or make contact, however you do that, messenger, um, social media, phone calls, in-person visits. And then based on how those phone calls go, I will determine my level of commitment. That is what most of us are doing. It's why it's so hard to go out and create what you want, because we are being victims of the symptoms of the downstream elements of our lives, rather than choosing to go as far upstream as we can into our thoughts, rather than being stuck in the wash in the middle that is our feelings. So if I feel like building a business, okay, and I make a few phone calls, and those calls don't go very well, Where's my level of commitment at? We are putting our commitment at risk of going backwards in the real process of progressing our lives, okay? I hope you're following this, that there's something we feel like doing for now, okay? Like I, I, I feel like building my business, so I take a few phone calls and determine the level of commitment. And let's say on a scale of one to 10, those calls didn't go well, so now my level of commitment is a five. Well, if my level of commitment is a five, what's, how likely am I gonna feel like building my business the next day? Okay, so the next day I still kind of feel like building my business, so I make less phone calls, feel more relieved when I get voicemails and don't have to actually talk to someone, that now my commitment has turned into a two. But I was able to avoid some things, okay? But then the next day something goes wrong, okay? I feel like I'm not getting enough time with my family. Someone said that I sounded salesy or whatever. We got some kind of negative feedback or we got a bill in the mail and so there's more pressure on us to make money. So now this level two commitment or even this level five commitment just gets obliterated. And so now I no longer feel like building my business. So I don't make any phone calls and I quit. Because I couldn't maintain, I couldn't sustain what I was doing to sabotage my level of commitment. This is a formula for destruction. <laughs> this is a formula for, for, for going backwards in life, okay? And, and settling for what we have. And then we start using preferences and rationalizations to keep ourselves stuck there. So this is what, and we've measured this in over 150,000 entrepreneurs and business leaders. And this is what the majority of us, because this is a human condition, so if you're a human, you're at risk of doing this, and we know from the over 150,000 people that we've measured that over 90% of us are at risk of, of surrendering to this process. We might be resilient depending on how high this feeling was. So let's say this feeling was even higher, so it might take us a few more times for us to deteriorate our commitment. But oftentimes when that rug gets pulled out and we're going this direction, and it always will, Life always seems to find a way to pull the rug out from under you. That we'll realize that our feelings that were driven to act, we actually find out a great, uh, a great discovery, which is, which is a lie in terms of this being an effective way to build a business, to build your dreams, to become more than who you are. And that is that oftentimes, early on or eventually, it is inevitable, we will do just enough to prove it doesn't work for us. When we are taking this on, and if you went to an event, the feeling's even higher, you read a good book, the feeling's even higher, you hired a coach even, and the feeling's even higher, and if you don't understand the way the mind works, then you might start higher so it takes a couple more days 
for us to land here and start doing just enough to prove that it doesn't work for us. And this decline happens as soon as our current reality shows up differently than we expected it to. Because when the feeling's high, expectations are high. It's inevitable when we're programming this backwards. When the feelings are high, expectations are high. So we may feel amazing up here, but it's setting us up that much more for the fall, okay? When the rug gets pulled out from under us, which happens in a, a thousand different ways, and every day something happens that doesn't line up to our expectations. So we're at risk of tumbling down and taking just enough action to prove that it doesn't work for us to justify our lack of commitment to it. We do this in our relationships too. Early on, it's called the honeymoon phase or infatuation. Feelings are high. Then as soon as that other person doesn't start showing up the way that we thought they were, and they don't match the expectations we got in the honeymoon phase or infatuation, we eventually get to the point where we do just enough in our relationship to prove that it doesn't work for us, to prove that they're a jerk, to rationalize our lack of commitment, to justify our lack of trust for another human being even those that are closest to us. Because we oftentimes can't isolate this pattern to just one area of our life. Let me get that glare off the screen. Okay? It's often impossible to isolate this pattern to just one area of life. If you do this in business, you more than likely do this in relationships. If you do this in relationships, you more than likely do this with your health. If you do this with your health, then you probably do it with your spirituality. There might be some that you're able to mitigate a little bit better depending on the frequency and the impact you can make on this feeling, but it's also really exhausting to run back up here and then boom, 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 and do just enough to prove that it wasn't for you, to give you the rationalization, the justifications, the reasons, the ugly E word, the excuses to justify your lack of commitment that was somehow supposed to be a byproduct of how you were feeling well, actions taken based on how you're feeling are going to be actions taken within those isolated preferences. And creating what you want in life has nothing to do with surrendering to your preferences. Quite the opposite. One of the first steps to being able to serve people is to let go of your feelings, let go of your preferences, and understand what theirs are. And then to be able to act on those. But that all starts here. See, what we're exposing here is that we have the right elements, okay? We want to feel good. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. We want to be in action because it makes us feel good, and we want to be in action based on a commitment we've made. So what we discover, if we're willing to, if we're willing to flip the script, which is really all there is to it, here's how it goes. We commit. Number one, that's what happens first. Commitments aren't made based on how you feel. Commitments aren't made on some limited, very humanistic, short-sighted perspective of whether you trust the process or not, or whether you trust someone else or not. I mean, faith is kind of an important part of this life, regardless of what you believe, okay? Any of you, whether you're religious or not, believe in creating more than you currently have and more than you can actually see. Like literally physically see, you can see it up here. It's one of the greatest tools we've had to be able to assist us with our faith, but it starts with commitment. We commit first. And when we commit first, we recognize down here the existing feelings that have tried to pull our commitment down in the past that we are no longer willing to surrender to. We acknowledge these feelings. We recognize them now. We're willing to illuminate them. Why weren't we willing to illuminate them before? Because they might have been embarrassing. They might have been, been judgmental, worried about how people would think of us if they knew how we really felt about things. Like, for example, there are some days you're just not feeling your kids. I've got three of the most adorable, beautiful, amazing little girls on planet Earth. There's some days I don't feel like being with them. I don't feel like pouring into them. Am I embarrassed about that? No, because they're just feelings. They're just thoughts. These are feelings and thoughts that are happening up here, but they're not me. They're just feelings and thoughts that I'm having. So if I make a commitment first, 
it puts me in an elevated position to be able to observe these, the feelings and thoughts I actually have. And there's one philosophy that's been taught for a long time that has ruined people's ability to do this. And that's positive thinking. Positive thinking has ruined our ability to commit, ruined our ability to choose us, to become aware of the feelings and thoughts that are holding us back. The unconscious mind has wreaked havoc on generation after generation that has been convinced that positive thinking is what gets you to your dreams. Bull crap in terms of the way that it's commonly interpreted. What's interesting is positive thinking. The positive, okay, breaking this down. Positive thinking. These are independent terms. Positive is what you do or act on, and thinking is what you're actually thinking. What makes it positive or negative is what you do or act on about it. But the challenge is most of us are looking at positive as some temperature gauge of whether something, the content itself is positive or negative, okay? If I'm sitting there going, I really don't feel like spending time reading a book with my six-year-old tonight, you know, or whatever it is, well, if that's viewed as negative, we're going to pretend that we're not thinking that. We're going to pretend that we're not feeling that. And we're going to deny what is about where we're at and what we're feeling, what we're, what we're thinking. And we're going to make it impossible to be able to do anything about it. That's what positive thinking has done to pollute personal development. Not because it was, it was taught wrong. It's been interpreted and adopted wrong. What makes your thinking positive or negative is what you are able to consciously do about it. Not what it is. If we were indicted for what we were thinking, all of us would be felons. We'd all be in prison. Because we've all thought something in the last couple weeks that if recorded straight out of our brain would have us thrown in, in jail. So the thinking piece is not what is positive or negative. It's what we do with it. How willing we are to elevate ourselves and look at it that makes it positive or not. Because one of the first keys to making commitment is to be able to choose you, to commit to you. And guess what? You think some crazy stuff. You feel really weird about certain things. I was, I was just talking with a, a, a client the other day who's just an amazing woman who had some tremendous concerns about being selfish or narcissistic. And I was like, that's because you are. You're human. Our brain is wired to be selfish. Our brain is wired to be narcissistic. Now, those are two terms that we've created that are an elevated, magnified version of those things, just like we're all a little psychotic, but we don't go around calling each other psycho or in clinical terms, because that's an elevated level of the craziness that's going on up here, a very concentrated level of the craziness that's going on in here. But we don't get to judge each other based on what we're thinking. We get to decide to illuminate it and make it positive by being able to choose it, own it, allow it to be a part of what you're actually feeling and thinking. Like, for example, if you're running a home-based business and you're constantly in this tug of war of, well, am I doing this for them or am I doing it for me? Because, And you're going to know when someone asks you, well, do you get paid if I sign up? Or if I make it to this level, are you going to benefit from that? And I, I, I've seen person after person squirm in that situation. Well, yeah, but I mean, take the focus off of what I'm feeling or what I'm, no, own that stuff. Heck yeah, I do. And so do you. So let's get to it. Let's make this happen. And, and sometimes that's a conversation you're having out loud with someone else, but at least start having the conversation with yourself that your thinking is neither positive nor negative. It's just, it's what you're thinking. So let's just get good at elevating ourselves and observing it and realizing what makes it good or bad, what makes it positive or negative, is what we decide to do about it. It's okay that sometimes I just, I don't feel like showing up for people. That's totally okay. But if I'm pretending that that's not there, man, that's going to create a major battle of 
going back into doing what I feel like and rationalizing and justifying it to eventually just do enough to prove that I shouldn't be doing that and then determine my commitment off of that rather than going the other direction, which is to commit to something, which is impossible to do if you're not willing to choose you, which means you're going to elevate and observe what your feelings and thoughts actually are rather than continuing to beat the crap out of yourself because what you're thinking and feeling doesn't line up with what's PC or doesn't line up with what's right or, or wrong or, or how you should or are supposed to think. And we talked about that um, in a previous power session. Um, I believe it was the last one, in fact. Where we talked about stop living the life you're supposed to and live who you are and start embracing that. That's, that's all this step. Because then when we do that, then we take action, we act, free of the fickle, short-term, volatile management of how we feel. Because we're observing how we feel, but we've elevated above it and made a commitment. For example, and then, and then we start taking action, and then guess what comes full circle? What comes full circle as we keep these thoughts and feelings down here where we observe them and we observe them and we observe them when we act consistently enough, guess what happens? The feelings we really want elevate. The feelings and thoughts we really want elevate. Not because we're embarrassed or we're judging ourselves for what's down here, but because we're taking action, turning the lion of terror into an ant of equanimity, putting us in a strong position to be able to observe self-judgment, to be able to observe not feeling worthy, to be able to observe our tendencies for perfection and making concrete conditions for our happiness, only to have ourselves fall short and then beat the crap out of ourselves even more for it. And the feelings that will serve us elevate. And the ones that won't stay down here. So we actually start to experience the feelings we wanted in the first place, rather than waiting for them to show up and dictate our action and then determine our level of commitment. Ogmandino summed this up beautifully and simply in scroll six in The Greatest Sales in the World when he said, strong are they who are weak are they who allow their thoughts or their feelings to control their actions and strong are they who force their actions to control their thoughts, which cannot be done if you don't commit first. So let's talk about the business. We make a commitment to the business. We make a decision. We commit, which means with and together. Okay, that's co, miter, which is the last part of mit, is to cast off, to release, to send away. What are we sending away? We're sending away the feelings that don't support our actions. We can observe them, understand that they're there, but we're no longer going to be dictated by them. Our commitment is no longer contingent on these thoughts and feelings. So now we can act liberated from our thoughts and feelings that are not serving us, and we take these actions based on a conscious commitment, not unconscious thoughts or feelings that we're waiting to show up in alignment with the stars so we can finally work consistently enough to hopefully get enough of a reason to be committed to what we're doing. Backwards, we're going to make a decision. We are going to commit. And the habit we're going to build in action is to continually keep these thoughts and feelings down here where we can observe them rather than be consumed by them. And when we feel these, these thoughts and feelings starting to creep up on our actions, we're going to take a look at our expectations. We're going to take a look at our self-judgment. And we're going to illuminate those things. And we're going to challenge our thoughts and feelings that don't serve us to come back down here where we can observe them, where we can maintain an elevated state of consciousness so that we can eventually feel in moments, these happen in moments, these feelings aren't permanent, no matter how committed you are, no matter how well you act, the feelings you're after will never be permanent. We take in the moments and understand what Og taught us later in the scrolls, that this too shall pass, which means this great moment will pass, and I'm going to be ready for the tough ones, because I know this too shall pass, and it's going to lead to another great one. Why, when we're in the zone, okay, which is really being in alignment with this, when we're in the zone, when we're in flow, and we fall out of it, we know that all we did was allow our thoughts and feelings to elevate up here and consume our commitment, consume our action. And we took feeling and put it back up here in the front to dictate our level of commitment and taking just enough actions 
to justify whether we want to be committed or not. Because if we're not feeling like it, we're not going to feel like being committed. So we're going to take just enough action and look for just the right amount of evidence to justify and prove that we shouldn't have been doing that anyway because we were allowing our thoughts and feelings to consume our action. It's that simple, but it's that hard. Because our mind is constantly trying to get feelings to bump butt in line. And you, you'll commit to something, make a total decision, take the actions, and start feeling amazing about it. But then something will happen. The rug gets pulled out from under us. We don't realize how high our expectations we're getting, especially for things that are really important to us and people that are really important to us. And feelings are just going to try and butt back into the front of the process. But we're going to elevate ourselves so that we can observe and illuminate our thoughts and feelings. Let me give you an example of, of how these thoughts and feelings come back up so, so often for us. Okay? And I'm going to use the example of forgiveness. Because it really illustrates the, the point really well. Okay, super messy, but that says forgiveness, <laughs> okay? So here's what, what we want to do. We want to make a commitment, okay, with and together. So with our own thoughts, with who we are, we choose ourselves. We are with ourselves rather than against ourselves, okay? And if you believe in a higher power, being with a higher power. And if you're looking to serve someone or forgive someone, you're doing it with them. And then you are casting off and releasing the tear, Okay, the things that are preventing you from being able to feel what you hope this will feel like. But here's one of the greatest challenges we run into, is we assume that this is step one, step two, and then when we feel this, case closed. I'm committing to forgive someone, so I take actions that someone who has made that commitment would take, and I feel awesome. So when I get around that person that normally would get a visceral response, I don't feel that. And we're immediately at risk of flipping it backwards right from that very moment, okay? Right from that very moment, as soon as we feel the outcome we were hoping to feel, we are at incredible risk of flipping it backwards because now we're feeling it. And so even good feelings want to butt ahead of our commitment. And as soon as we've done that, as soon as we start putting too much stock into feelings being the driver of our lives, we are at immediate risk of as soon as we don't feel that way, and reading scroll six, we feel differently every day. So just because yesterday you had made a commitment to forgive so-and-so, so you acted as someone who was committed to forgiveness, and you felt like you had forgiven them, what your brain immediately wants to do is say, yeah. You've forgiven them. Congratulations. I'm sorry, that's a, that's a lie. And it's not serving you. I happen to believe something that may not be super popular, and that is that we can never forgive people in this life. As in, case closed, I've totally forgiven them. What we can do is be totally committed to being in the process of forgiveness for the rest of our lives. Okay? Because if there's a strong enough need to forgive someone, the likelihood that you're going to be able to eradicate that scar or that damage or those thoughts from your life. And those of you sitting there saying, no, I've totally forgiven people. No, what you've done is you've committed to creating the habit of forgiveness, the process. You've committed to being in the process of forgiveness, and you've been able to sustain it over a long period of time. But I've seen way too many people that have committed to forgiving someone, taken the actions that supported it, felt amazing, and then as soon as something happened that didn't feel amazing, feel like they're right back at square one with that person. And then beating the living tarnation out of themselves because they weren't in an elevated position to be able to see that all they did was flip this around. They felt like, I've forgiven that person. No, I don't think that happens, okay? One of my great friends and one of our coaches, Dean Smith, who is in an award-winning film about, live to, it's called Live to Forgive, who his mother was murdered with a baseball bat by his stepfather, uh, a baseball bat he got for Christmas, by the way, when he was young. And uh, it's an amazing story. I highly recommend that you go download it, watch it, Live to Forgive. It's incredible. But he taught me something amazing about forgiveness 
as who I consider one of the greatest consummate experts of forgiveness on planet earth, that it is a lifelong and even tedious process. And as soon as we assume it's done, we're at risk of falling out of it. We're, we're at risk of falling out of passion, falling out of forgiveness, falling out of what we want to create. This happens in our relationships too, okay? So let's say we're committed to love. We're committed to loving our spouse. So we make this commitment and we take the actions of someone who is committed to loving someone, okay? And then we feel the love. And as soon as we feel that deeper sense of commitment, as soon as we feel that love, we're at risk of flipping the script back over and being like, oh, I feel in love with them. So I must be, except that now we've flipped it around. So the feeling is what is confirming our commitment rather than our commitment driving our action to confirm the feeling. And so we assume I'm in love with them. So I'm always going to feel in love with them because I've committed to being in love with them. No, the feeling comes and goes. But if we start with the commitment, it will always be within reach and it can always grow. But just like forgiveness, if we assume I love them and just case closed, I love them. And we stop taking actions or something happens that the rug gets pulled out from under us in that relationship. And we start taking actions just to prove the feelings that we had. It disintegrates our commitment. We can do this in our business. We can do this with surrendering, which is a big part of growing. Oftentimes getting to where you want to go in life is about letting it happen rather than making it happen. Because then we try to make our feelings happen and get frustrated when we don't feel that way. And so it dictates our actions. And then we move on to the next thing or just assume that wasn't going to work for us or that just wasn't mine. Okay. Let's be willing to become aware of this process. Let's be willing to choose ourselves. Choose your feelings and your thoughts. Stop allowing them to judge you and stop judging them. Stop allowing them to dictate your worth and worthiness, your contributions and your character, because they don't. They're just thoughts and feelings that when we can elevate ourselves into a position where we're not ignoring them because we were taught that those are negative and we're only going to pay attention to the positive ones, you're only getting half the script. In fact, probably even less than that because a lot of what we think is negative and we're just pretending that those thoughts aren't there. We're allowing them to sneak up in the night and consume our commitment and force us to wait till we feel like it. Wait for the natural cycle of human emotion and other challenges for the stars to align so that we can try and take action long enough while we're feeling like it, that we can establish a strong enough commitment, but we never can because we're starting with feeling when we should be starting with commitment. In your relationships, but Paul, my spouse did something and I just can't trust them. Okay. Well, trust doesn't even drive the relationship. Commitment comes first. Trust is a natural output of your commitment. If you are committed to someone, you trust them. Because trust can be just as fickle as feelings. Because what you're actually saying is I don't feel like I can trust them. I don't feel like I can trust them. That's different from being able to commit to them and trusting them because of your commitment, not because of your feelings, that will then allow you to take the actions of someone who is committed and trusting to be able to get the feelings to confirm that commitment and action, and then being sensitive to the fact that as you're getting the feelings you were looking for, that you don't allow your unconscious mind to flip that script back over, because then you're at risk of something happening that chops your legs out from under you and the feelings, and then it's going to disintegrate your actions and you'll do just enough to prove that your commitment should be questioned or redirected. Very simple process that a lot of us are experiencing backwards. It is counterintuitive in a lot of ways, especially because oftentimes we're spending a lot of time trying to consider the difference between our intuition and our feelings. And that's tough to do, but it's very important to understand that intuition is driven by commitment and action. The more clear you are on your commitment, the more clear you are on your action, the clearer it will be to separate just feelings from intuition. But too often, 
we've gone backwards and disintegrated our drive, disintegrated our quality of our actions, and disintegrated our commitment. And so we're, we're sitting in a parked car going, what should I do? How, how can I get out of this? How can I change this? What should I do? What should I do? Commit to something and do it. Because what we're really saying is, what do I feel like doing? That's what we're really asking. If we get real about it, what do I feel like doing? And if I'm supposed to do something, God, please make me feel like doing it. Are you serious? That's what you think is going to happen? What do I feel like doing? And God, if you could just make me feel like doing what I should do, then I'll do it. Oh, if only life could be that easy. If only we, there was a power in this universe that's going to make us feel like doing what we should do to then be able to establish our commitment after the fact. No, it doesn't work that way. The God I believe in doesn't work that way. No power for good in this universe works that way. Every once in a while, we'll get lucky and our feeling will already be in alignment with our commitment. But remember, even then, we're at risk of flipping it back around and allowing our feelings to guide us, to lead, to drive the steering wheel. That's a scary place to be when you start to illuminate the thoughts and feelings that are under the surface that can manipulate everything here. But with a conscious mind, when we are conscious of our commitment to forgive, that's when we feel like we've forgiven. But when you don't feel like you've forgiven, it's because your brain case closed. We've already done that. No, you don't already do that. You make a commitment to living in that process for the rest of your life. Oh, yeah, I've already let go of that anger towards that person. Impossible. You suppressed it. You pushed it down here. And so it's sneak attacking you constantly because you're not allowing yourself to be aware of the fact that it's still there because you've been convinced that you were done with that. We're never done with that. We make a commitment to use it and to take action with it and to find out how we can serve. And then we feel inspired. And when we feel inspired, we elevate our commitment and take more action and feel more inspired. And then we feel an even greater sense of commitment. And we take even more action. And we feel even more inspired. And then Og gave us a great lesson. Sometimes we won't feel inspired. But that doesn't change our commitment and our action. It does if we're being led by our feelings. Whew. Take a look at this chat here for a second. Kim said, we act just enough to prove it isn't working. I wonder if at times we also act just enough to feel like we're doing something as well. <laughs> totally. Um, just enough to take the pressure off the pain of not, manage, of not making progress. Um, for example, at least I didn't gain weight. I did enough to not gain, but not enough to lose. Does that make sense? No, totally on base, Kim. Really beautifully put. I don't, I'm not even going to comment on it because it's just, it's just beautifully said that we don't just act enough to prove it isn't working. We'll often do just enough um, to feel like we're doing it really well. Justifications, rationalizations working both ways. So powerful stuff. How does maintaining your energy relate to this? Great question, Dana. So I'm... Um, I talked uh, in, in the past and talking a lot with clients about the quality of your energy. I think one of the number one contributors to the quality of your energy is this distance right here. Making a commitment that elevate the commitment elevates you. The commitment elevates you and allows you to observe these things without them determining who you are. So I can see that, yeah, there's sometimes that, um, that I, I, I feel like, you know, just, wanting to scream at my kids, but I don't. But guess what? I've done that before, and it's usually when I pretend that I wasn't feeling that way. It's usually when I'm driven by expectations that I'm not aware of, and they don't line up because I wasn't in an elevated posi po uh, per position of commitment. So the quality of your energy starts by being able to acknowledge what's really going on under the surface, what you're actually thinking. What are your secret desires and real intentions? Are you doing what you do because you really want to help people or because you want to make money? Well, 100% of the time, it's both in businesses like this. 
There's part of you that wants to do it to make money, but assuming that that makes you impure if you really just want to be helping people. And how do we know that? Well, because, and we've talked about this before, the base part of the brain operates in systemic conditions, all or nothing. So that part of the brain, which is one of the strongest parts of the brain, it's where the fight or flight center is, can't comprehend doing something to serve people and to make money to serve yourself at the same time. It doesn't compute. It's either one or the other. And so we get into this inner battle, this inner turmoil, and this just gets all jumbled up because we're waiting for our actions and our feelings to determine our level of commitment. And so this all just gets mixed rather than making a commitment, making a decision. Okay. And in our group coaching and in our individual coaching, we take our clients through true decision-making the decisions we make in terms of how we're actually thinking and what we're going to actually do differently with our thoughts, the true order of commitment. Cause it's a lot easier. It's a, it's a lot deeper, a lot more difficult to implement than just understanding you know, the hopscotch of commit, act, feeling, and going the other direction. But that quality of energy, Dana, okay, has to do with being in an elevated position. When your quality of energy is being sucked out, it's, it's simply because your awareness, your elevated state, your heightened level of awareness is not intact. We've allowed our thoughts to consume ourselves at that point. And sometimes we become aware of that and we make a commitment, but we still feel the lower quality of energy, well, that's simply because our feelings had released chemicals. We had surrendered to this process of going backwards, and now we've got some chemicals. We've got some unhealthy patterns to work through. So you may make a commitment, a decision, and then want to speed up feeling showing up sooner and even take a couple of actions. But if you only take a couple of actions, you still don't feel it, and you quit on your commitment, you weren't actually committed. Your quality of energy comes from filling this pipeline. And if we surrender to it, you could be in a, in a quality of energy hangover for quite a while, which is why we want to be hypersensitive to this whole process, why we want to be aware of where our thoughts and our feelings are really at, rather than wait for them to be in alignment or pretend that they're in alignment when they're really not. Let's just start looking at what is. Is intuition considered a feeling? My gut says yes, but I want to process this a little bit. Intuition, in most cases, shows up as a feeling. The value of our intuition completely depends on the action we take on that feeling. And it is like building a muscle. You're going to get little pieces of intuition and act on them and may not see magnificent, earth-shattering oh, kind of experiences from it. But if you don't act on the little ones, you're not going to get the bigger ones. And you're not going to get better at being able to understand the difference. So I can tell you this, that feelings of being consumed by your feelings and your thoughts can, can be very destructive. And for a lot of us, they naturally are. Intuition can be feelings as well, but if you haven't made a commitment and you're not in action, your intuition isn't worth anything. Intuition is only as good as it is acted upon. And those actions, when not driven by commitment, are going to be temporary. And we will not see it through far enough to be able to see where our intuition paid off to then reinforce the desire to get inspired for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Even getting to a great place, and that's realizing that we don't always get confirmation that our intuition was correct, but we can start to trust that it is because we were committed to it. And we'll have just enough evidence here or there with consistency in this space to realize that if it was true here, then just by principle, it was probably true there. So that's some pretty deep stuff, <laughs> okay? Um, Dana, in terms of, uh, um, as well as, uh, oh, where did the question go? who asked about into and um, uh in terms of uh, some deep stuff in terms of a group that that would be much easier to go over with your personal habit finder in an individual setting. So do you manage your commitment by being aware of your feelings and it gets easier over time, new habit. And so that's, that's one of the challenges curious is, is the management of our commitment is about taking the actions that support it. 
period. When you are committed, when you make a decision, you aren't cutting off your feelings. Those are still there. We're just maintaining an elevated position of them, okay? But we are cutting off the actions that don't support the commitment. It's just, it's not on the menu anymore. And so how we manage our commitment is by taking the actions that support it regardless of these, regardless of the feelings. If you're truly committed, what's the difference if it's a feeling or intuition? Um, if you're truly committed, what's the difference if it's a feeling or intuition? Well, intuition is a feeling, but not all feelings are intuition. Um, and truly committed is, is tough to say, very similar to saying I've, I've forgiven you, to say I'm truly committed is usually what's putting you in a position to not be. Uh, I've shared this before as a competitive powerlifter for years, and in powerlifting competitions, you squat first, then you bench press, then you deadlift. And I ask people all the time which one they think is the most dangerous. And the answer is whichever one you think you're the best at. As soon as you think you've forgiven, you're setting yourself up to have that rug pulled out from under you. As soon as you think you've let go of anger or traumatic experiences, you're setting up to have the rug pulled out from you, under you. Because what you've committed to is the process of forgiveness. What you've committed to is the process of getting better. What you've committed to is a process. And building habits that support the process, not building the habits that, case closed, done. Don't ever have to worry about that ever again. No. You've made a commitment to a lifelong transformation, to a lifelong process. That's how this works. Um, should intuition always be acted upon? As you get clearer and clearer on it, if it supports your commitment, okay, I would act on it. Um, but there are certain universal laws that you're going to want to understand about that to help you guide that intuition. You know, like if, you're, if, if your intuition says that, you know, you should go sleep with somebody else because your spouse just isn't the right person for you, that's not intuition, that's preference. That's sacrifice of, of feelings and being consumed by unhealthy habits of thinking. Now, does that mean that your intuition was wrong, that your spouse may not be the right person for you? You're not in a position to make that call if you're thinking about cheating on them, okay? So we wanna make sure that our life is in alignment to act on the intuition, okay? If I've got a heavy load under me and I'm not in a good position for my spine, and I act on that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wreck myself. So alignment is key, Jennifer, in terms of acting upon, um, acting upon your intuition. Alignment with, with the values of the universe, of the values of, of the mathematics, of what we cover in the, in the habit finder. So, all right. Okay, went a little longer than I expected, so I'm gonna hop off and sign off. Um, just grab something from this. It's amazing to me how, how powerful awareness is, but how cheap we can look at it. Because I know a lot of you are going, okay, well, how do I do that? Like when I talked about preferences and principles, I got a lot of emails and comments about, well, how do I do that? Well, you need to become more conscious of it first. And the very question, the very reason you're asking how do I do that is because the consciousness isn't at a level that you can take action within alignment. So the first thing we need to do is create greater elevation. This requires patience which a lot of us, especially as entrepreneurs, don't have. To create patience, to be able to observe, to be able to release judgment and energy and no longer seek positive thinking in terms of our thinking needs to be positive. No, positive is what we're going to do with the thinking we're going to become aware of. Not sitting there and going, oh, that's negative, I'm going to ignore that. That's positive, let's think about that some more. That's negative, I'm going to know. Allowing it all to come in and teach you from an observed position, from sitting in the observer's chair, as we've taught. And if any of you haven't read that, um, jump on our website and go order a copy because that's an incredible book to be familiar with. In fact, it's right here. Incredible book to be familiar with um, on this topic if you've never read it before. So, all right. Yes, chew on it for a while, Debbie, for sure. Be patient with it. Um, oftentimes, awareness, okay, it takes time to set in, but it's one of the most concrete ways to evolve and grow. So be careful to not slip out of the awareness and sacrifice the higher level of consciousness for just do, 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 and go, 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 okay? Still take action, of course. Always take action, but be careful not to take action to, to distract yourself from your commitment and your alignment and your level of awareness. 
All right. Woo, that was deep. That was a lot. But hopefully you got just one little thing from that. If you're struggling with some of these things, you want to take these deeper and maybe time to consider taking on a coaching engagement to be able to really drill down into this stuff. If you can see what flipping this process around, if you can see what being driven by your feelings, even though you've rationalized that that's not what you were doing, but you kind of had your eyes open to that today, and you can see how much value you could pour into your life and how much value you could pour into other people's lives by flipping this, maybe time to consider how to do this, how to take this to a deeper level. And I've got incredible coaches that can help you do that in an amazing way to create a lifelong return um, on your investment. So thanks so much, everybody. Have an awesome day. We'll talk to you later.